So welcome to the Climax uh, Ideas and Action Seminar Series. So uh, we try to have these every two weeks. And uh, so Climax is a joint DPFL and Renewal uh, Center, which highlights climate research and teaching uh, and tries to raise ambition on climate action. And these seminars have been going on for a little while and uh, we try to have them every two weeks. We try to um, have the goal within them of going sort of beyond just presenting our research and trying to go into what are the frontiers um, and going beyond what is what is already done. So how this research can really help stir action. And uh, I just remembered, I'm, I'm so very sad that I had forgotten that there's a reason to be sad. So this is obviously not a great day in Switzerland. So everybody who's coming in, we, we feel sad too about the result of the vote. And we really need to think about what it's going to take to change um, to change things going forward, to change the debate and, and, and what we're doing. Um, so please keep your microphone and video off unless you're speaking. If you are speaking and asking questions, we'd really love to see and hear you. Um, no harassment, obviously. The seminars are recorded, will be posted online. To ask questions, you can either write them in the chat or raise your hand. Uh, the seminars are bilingual English French, so speak, feel free to speak your language. Um, and uh, today's speakers are uh, Jeremy Luderbacher um, from um, Chemical Process Engineering and EADPFL, who's talking about building a sustainable plant-based chemical industry, and he's our first speaker. And so, Jeremy, uh, the floor is yours. I will now stop sharing. Well, thanks very much for the in invitation. So, as was said, I'm going to talk about um, making sustainable chemicals from from plants. And to you know, since I only have 15 minutes, I'll try to be quick, but um, kind of zoom into the subject. So I'll start by talking about our current sort of carbon economy. Then I'll talk about plants as a feedstock um, to produce sort of as a renewable carbon feedstock. And finally, I'll show a specific example of producing a renewable chemical from plants, sort of from research in my lab that I think nicely illustrates both um, sort of the challenges and opportunities of this type of research. So let's begin with the context. And I think the context in which we live today, I think we can all pretty much agree that we're surrounded by carbon and especially fossil carbon. And so I think most people, when they think of fossil carbon, they think of this, right? They think of fuel and gasoline, but probably this crowd feels this is that it's, it's a lot more than that. You find fossil carbon in things like textiles, plastics, detergents, a lot of household items, and even some of the food we eat, especially if you use sort of low quality or go to McDonald's and get a vanilla milkshake or something, you're gonna, you're gonna ingest molecules that are made um, from petroleum. So the point is, is that oil sort of reaches far into our society and we're very dependent on it. And you can see this also by just looking at what a barrel of oil is converted to. So of course it's converted to a lot of fuel, but it's also about 20% just everyday products. And I'll sort of uh, attract your attention, especially to this 18% products and also to jet fuel. Those are two interesting fractions because they're two fractions that we're not gonna be able to substitute by just switching to electric cars or electric trucks. Right now, there are no good solutions for producing those things other than from oil, or we have to find another source of renewable carbon. So we need, if we're gonna build a sustainable society, we need renewable carbon. And if we look at our planet, there's really only two big, big sources of renewable carbon. The first is atmospheric CO2, that's by far the biggest. And the second is plants, Those, that's it. Those are the two big sources. So just because of how short that list is, I will argue that in, in the society of the future, both are guaranteed to have sort of an important role in providing carbon to our society. And we can sort of find out a little more about the current state of technology for these two feedstocks by looking at the cost that we've assigned to them, which I think is quite interesting. And so you might've heard a lot, it's been a lot in the news lately that you can pull CO2 out of the atmosphere to try to capture it. There's been uh, notably a Swiss company, Climeworks, that has made a lot of noise. And the current cost projections for this vary widely because it's an immature technology. It goes from the very unoptimistic $1,000 per ton of CO2 all the way to the startup companies, which are trying to sell you something. So you should take this with a grain of salt they project somewhere between $100 and $250 per ton. 
Um, now, if you compare that to plants, uh, plants are a mature technology in the sense that agriculture has been producing them for thousands of years now. And we, there we know exactly how much they cost. And if you look at the market for just plant matter, it's around 40 to $150 per ton. So 150 would be more like prices you'd find in Switzerland, 40 more like prices you'd find in the US. And plants are already partially reduced carbon, meaning if you translate them to actual CO2, and so you can have a one-to-one -one comparison, the price goes down and you're at around 20 to $80 per ton. I'll throw in a third number, which is capturing CO2 um, not from the atmosphere, but from the sort of tailpipe of a combustion operation. So this could be a coal plant. And there, of course, the, the catch is that you're not actually, if you capture that CO2, you're not reducing the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, but you're at least not adding new CO2 to it. And there the price is closer to plants. It's around 28, 28 to hundred dollars per ton. And so what I'm trying to illustrate here is that there's very exciting things. And I believe in direct capture from atmospheric CO2 using dedicated technology, but just from the prices, you can see it's still very immature. And basically the way to think about plant matter is it's a very cheap way of pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere, a very mature technology that we know how to manage. And of course, plants do more than just pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere. They also reduce it, meaning they remove oxygen and they actually store energy in chemical bonds. And one way to look at it is plants are also sort of a, a solar energy uh, capturing device. They, essentially, they store um, solar energy as chemical energy. And of course, they're not, uh, they're not anywhere near 100% efficient in doing that for several reasons. Um, some of it is because you uh, they they don't capture the entire spectrum of light and the other main reason is that they have to stay alive while they're converting this solar to chemical energy and that takes energy on its own so you see theoretical efficiencies for a leaf vary depending on the type of plant but they're somewhere around five percent in reality it's lower than that because of course not every part of a plant is a leaf and not every leaf is in the sun and so if you look at real world numbers for crops which are basically optimized systems you're on the order of one to three percent in conversion efficiency that drops to if you were to walk around a forest a random plant would be much, usually lower than two percent as low as 0.1 percent and to give you an order of magnitude that's much lower than a typical solar panel. Typical solar panel converts solar energy at about at least 10 times that, about 20 to 30%. So plants are fairly inefficient, um, but they're cheap because they kind of grow on their own and they grow all over the planet, right? So you don't have to do anything. Plants just grow and they grow all the time. And so even if they're inefficient, they actually store a fair amount of energy each year. And to give you an idea, I, I like this graph. It, it compares sort of the, it's a little bit old now, it dates back to 2007. So the numbers might have changed a little bit, but it illustrates the point nicely. It compares our annual global energy consumption to the fossil, to the fossil reserves we have. So this is total reserves. And then it compares that to the total amount of renewables that you could capture each year. And the first thing that should jump out at you is there's a huge amount of energy that hits our planet every year as sunlight. And even if plants are inefficient, that translates to a fair amount of energy stored through photosynthetic processes, so as chemical energy in plants. In fact, every year, um, the energy in stuff that grows is about 10 to 20 times the energy that we use. So you might say, okay, problem solved, we can get all our energy from plants. But using 10% of that uh, energy with 100% efficiency to use to sort of produce our energy is a very unrealistic scenario. To give you an idea, we would roughly have to use all the crops we grow and convert them with 100% energy efficiency to sort of meet our energy demand. So that's unrealistic. We cannot use plants to sort of get all our energy. That's, that's a scenario that you shouldn't consider feasible. However, um, getting somewhere around 20%, which again, that's roughly the fraction of a barrel of oil um, that goes to chemicals. And maybe a little more if you wanted to cover something like jet fuel, that becomes at least in the realm of something um, feasible. So just looking at scales, 
that becomes something that you could at least consider. And so it's not unreasonable to think that plants will at least have a role, maybe along with captured CO2. Um, now, another benefit that I think is often undersold of the fact that plants grow everywhere is that actually has some geopolitical benefits. And if <clears throat> you probably all realize that right now, the fossil energy we use is very, uh, is very poorly distributed throughout the planet. And again, this slide is a tiny bit old, it's five years old, but the point rather, uh, the point remains the same. If you look at the places that have oil versus the ones that use oil, you tend to see that the places that have oil tend to be very specific, not always very big countries, often not democratic, and the places that use a lot of oil are usually much bigger, have much stronger economies, and um, tend to be democratic, though not always. And so this naturally creates geopolitical imbalances, and this has a cost that's not often thought about. And to illustrate the cost that this has, um, you can look at a very simple example. You can compare the U.S. naval fleets between 1980 and 2009. And in 1980, the U.S. naval fleet was roughly the same as it was right after World War II. They had four naval fleets, one in the Atlantic, two in the Pacific, and one in the Mediterranean. And after that, over the years, they added two fleets. They added one around South America and one on the Horn of Africa. And those fleets were, that were added basically exclusively to protect oil supply routes. And this just shows you, and that has a huge cost that isn't sort of factored directly in the price of gasoline, but it's there and our society pays for it, even if it's indirectly for if you live in Switzerland. And I think this is an often undersold benefit of switching to renewable energy is that it's much better distributed than fossil energy is. Now, if I'm to summarize, so what are the benefits? How should you think of the plant uh, feeds as a carbon feedstock, you should think of it as something that's relatively inefficient, but very cost effective, fairly cheap, um, and it's well distributed. And it's a direct air carbon capture technology that allows you to take CO2 out of the atmosphere and fix it as chemical energy. Now, most of plants on this planet, uh, the largest amount of plants are so-called lignocellulosic plants or lignocellulosic biomass. That's a fancy word for things like leaves, trees, grasses. So all the unedible plant material you see every day. And those are made up of plant cells. And well over 90% of the, the weight of a plant cell is found in its plant cell wall, which is a macrofibrillar and microfibrillar bundle of three biopolymers which are chains of molecules. So you have chains of glucose, which is cellulose, probably all heard of it. You have chains of mostly xylose, another sugar that makes up hemicellulose. And finally, you have something called lignin, which is a polyaromatic structure. So basically there's these three chains of molecules in plants that we can use. And the question we have in our lab is how can we effectively transform um, these biopolymers into petrochemical substitute. And I'll show you one example to finish the talk here. And I'll focus on the word effectively here because I think that's key is you can do pretty much anything. And I'll show you an example of this is in making um, bioplastic replacements and specifically uh, plastic that you all probably have heard of, which is PET. Now you can take the sugar fraction. So remember plants are two thirds sugar. So you can take sugar from plants and you can go all the way to terephthalic acid, which is the main building block in PET. And I'm not gonna take you through the organic chemistry of it. You probably don't care. The point I'm just trying to make here is that there's a lot of steps. You see, you can get from here all the way to terephthalic acid, but it takes a lot of steps, a lot of energy, a lot of chemical transformation, they generate waste. And so you can do pretty much anything, but can you do it effectively? And this is an example where making, doing it from uh, sustainably and cost effectively will be difficult just because of how much transformation occurs. And the kind of things we're doing in our lab is to ask the question, can we make similar products, but in an easier way? And specifically what we've been looking at is, let me just move this here out of my screen. So what we've been looking at is functionalization chemistry, which is uh, kind of a fancy word for saying, we're gonna take sugar 
And this is the structure, the chemical structure of sugar. And we're just kind of gonna decorate it. So instead of taking something like sugar and dragging it all the way over to the molecule we use today, can we just keep sugar intact, but decorate it in a way that it acts like the molecule? And you can see these two kind of look alike. They have similar chemical structures without changing the core. And by not changing it, we have to do much less steps. In fact, we could do it in one step. We can essentially just cook wood and get this molecule and then build a plastic from it, which again is kind of a chain of molecules. And this is a process we've um, developed in the lab. These are pictures. So this is, this is very new research actually. It's, um, this is pictures from our lab of this plastic we made. So it's completely unique uh, to our lab and to EPFL. This is what comes out of our reaction vessel. We can make it into fibers, we can make films, we can 3D print it. This doesn't look that great, but it was our first try. So it's actually pretty good. And we can vacuum form it to make packaging. What's also neat is because it's made of sugar, it has nice end of life properties. So we can easily do chemical recycling. So we can mix it with all kinds of other plastic waste and target the specific chemical linkage depolymerize it and then repolymerize it to make a completely virgin plastic. So we don't lose quality as is typical in other sort of uh, plastic recycling operations. And finally, probably the most interesting is it because of its nature, it degrades in water and it degrades back to sugar, which is obviously completely non-toxic and environmentally friendly. So it you can see that it stays intact um, at room temperature for about 80 days, which is a good length. We're trying to tweak this a little bit. And then it sort of falls, uh, it starts falling apart. If it's at 37 degrees, so your sort of physiological temperature, it'll fall apart after 20 days. So that's interesting sort of from an environmental leakage point of view. And the main example here, all the benefits that we're getting, we're getting because we've kept the structure intact. And this is really where we see a huge opportunity. So a lot of the work that had been done up to now is to say, how can we take plants and kind of drag them, retrofit them all the way to produce exactly what we use now. And I think there's a real opportunity to, instead of doing that, to say, can we build a, new, a completely new chemistry that's tailored to the feedstock we're using, so to plants, and make new products and in doing so be more sustainable and more cost-effective. And we've done that by basically keeping the building block of plants, which is sugars is completely intact. And this is what I'm highlighting here. You can see in the structure of the plastic, the sugar is still there, it hasn't changed. And because of that, it's much easier to do. So I'll end there. Um, this is my group here at EPFL. And I'll especially highlight um, this plastic work was done by um, Lorenz and, and Stefania. And so they get a lot of the credit for doing the actual work. And with that, I'll be glad to take uh, questions in either English ou en français. I'm happy to answer those as well. So we're going to move over to Johan's talk. So, uh, you're, so Johan Gaume is head of the uh, unit of Snow Avalanche Simulation Laboratory he is an SNF um, Excellenza professor and guest scientist at the WSL Institute for Snow and Avalanche Research um, in Davos. And we're really excited to hear about snow avalanche in a climate change context. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julia, for the introduction. Can you all hear me? Is it okay? Can you see the slides? Yeah, okay, perfect. Thank you for the invitation. Today I will talk about snow avalanches in a, in a climate change context. And in this presentation, I will mostly uh, be interested in the results of uh, other groups on the effect of climate change on snow avalanche activity. So a little bit different to, to what we are doing in our lab, which uh, focuses on the modeling of snow avalanches, which uh, can of course uh, be linked to climate change as uh, snow properties may change with the climate and we can input that in our modeling approaches, but this is not what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, first of all, a little bit of, uh, of context. Uh, avalanches in Europe, it's 150 victims, approximately 30 in France, 25 in, in Switzerland, and about uh, 10, 20 million euros of damages with some uh, uh, dramatic years, uh, in particular the year 1999, with uh, about 1 billion of damage. 
and um, and I'm also thinking about this particular winter. We had a, we had a very late winter, and in France between the end, the end of April and uh, the end of May there was uh, 12 fatalities due to a, due to a very late uh, uh, winter. And I will mention also the, a bit about that in the, in the presentation. Uh, here it's, um, it's a little um, um, scheme from Gadek uh, et al, which, uh, which I like, because when we think about uh, the effect of climate on snow avalanches, we generally think of the effect on the, on the snow cover, which is included here in this uh, uh, let me put the laser pointer. So on this side, so you have the snow depth, of course, the snow cover duration, and importantly, the snow cover uh, stability. But here on the right side, you have also the forest, which is which is very important because it can prevent avalanches from releasing in uh, in release zones. But it, it can also act as a protection of uh, villages or roads uh, in the in the runout zone. And so all of these uh, all of these uh, potential factors are influenced by air temperature and precipitation, and uh, I will talk about it briefly in this uh, in this context here. Uh, you all know these curves. Uh, that's the uh, mean air temperature here in Switzerland, and we clearly see this uh, this increasing trend that you uh, all know about. For precipitations, it's a little bit less clear, although we can uh, uh, depict uh, a slightly increasing trend, which is. Uh, more uh, uh, pronounced at, uh, at higher elevation. So these changes, of course, will uh, affect uh, the snow cover, but also uh, the vegetation. Uh, on the snow cover, so some observations here is that there is a significant decrease of the snow cover at uh, low elevation uh, stations. No clear trend above 2000 meters, a general uh, reduction of the, of the winter, uh, regardless of the elevation. So we have earlier melt in spring and, and uh, I mentioned this particular year, so this is uh, this is going against uh, this this trend I'm mentioning. Uh, this year we had a, a very late uh, winter, and uh, finally a, a decrease, an apparent decrease in the, in the annual maximum. Um, now, uh, what I will talk about here uh, is two types of uh, of data. So, first of all, reconstruction of snow avalanches based on tree ring analysis in three places: Himalayas, Montana, and Switzerland and uh, observations uh, as well. And in particular, we will look at uh, uh, different types of avalanches and how they evolve in the changing climate. And finally, we'll talk about the runout distance. So basically the, the elevation at which uh, the avalanche uh, stops in, in a climate change context. So first of all, uh, tree ring analysis. So uh, you may or may not be familiar with this technique. Uh, when an avalanche uh, occurs, the snow mass, if it hits a tree, it may, uh, it may bend, uh, it may uh, hurt or even break the tree depending on the, on the impact energy. And um, these uh, morphologies are associated with some um, characteristics on the anatomy of the tree, which can be precisely dated using a technique called dendrochronology. And so the, the different scars can be identified manually and they have a, a different size, a different color. And this, this, uh, this allows you to define a, an index of gross damage which can be used to reconstruct uh, avalanche uh, series. And so I will uh, start with this uh, analysis in the Himalayas by uh, some colleagues at the University of, uh, of Geneva. And they are interested in this particular uh, avalanche slope here. In red, you have the sample trees and here you have the potential release zones. And uh, the elevation is uh, 4,200 meters uh, for the release zone and 2,600 meters for the runout zone. So quite, quite a, a, a high elevation. And they sampled 140 trees and they detected more than 500 anomalies. And what they see is the, is the, is the following. Uh, clearly, uh, you see uh, on the top here the events which are reconstructed with those lines. And at the bottom, you see an index uh, which basically characterizes the, the gross damage of the tree. So this is, this is an, an index which um, uh, characterizes the, the avalanche activity and the avalanche intensity. And something which is, which is quite striking is that uh, the level is quite low until the 60s. And after the 60s, 70s, you see a, a, a significant change in this uh, gross damage index. So when we see that uh, 60, 70 is a big change, we, we want to link it to, to climate change. And this is what they have done. They, they have done a, a principal component analysis to, to link this, uh, this index of gross damage to some potentially important uh, climate variables. 
And their analysis is showing that uh, the three most important variables are the following. The first is the February and March cumulated precipitation, the warming temperatures between December and March, and finally, the variability of air temperatures in January. And these three principal components, they explain 55% of the, of the total variance. And so based on this uh, analysis, they developed uh, a model uh, which is called uh, GLARMA, Generalized Linear Autoregressive Moving Average Model, which um, has also, uh, uh, even if it's mentioning a linear, there is a moving average and autoregressive character, which is uh, able to characterize the nonlinear nature of, of, of these events. Uh, so for instance, uh, the fact that after a big avalanche, the, the, the forest may have been destroyed. So you need to take that into account for the future years in the, in the analysis. And so what the model is showing here is clearly there is uh, here on the y-axis, you have the probability of snow avalanche as a function of the year. And you see a, a clear uh, increasing trend uh, after the 70s, the probability is larger than 50%. And, um, and this, is, um, this is quite interesting. Remember that this is at, uh, at high elevation. Now we'll go to a, a different study in Montana, in the Northern Rocky Mountains, and they used uh, similar techniques, so dendrogeomorphology, so analysis of, uh, of tree rings. And here the, the, the sites, um, the study site is a little bit different. The spatial extent is larger, so you can see that they sample trees in different paths, but also uh, in different uh, uh, mountains. And here, the elevation is, is uh, quite different. It's from 1,000 to 2,700 meters elevation. And here they sampled about 600 trees and they recorded uh, using this technique more than 2,000 uh, gross disturbances representing uh, avalanche events. And here is what they show. They show here the snow water equivalent in millimeters as a function of the year. And they marked the avalanche years with these triangles. And what you see here, but it's not obvious, is that those triangles, they are mostly located uh, on the peak rather than uh, at the bottom of this curve. But you can see that more clearly, if you look at the bottom, at the box plot of uh, uh, the classified avalanche years and non-avalanche years, and clearly you see that avalanche years occur when you have a higher snow water equivalent uh, or a higher uh, snow height, uh, HS. And this is true regardless of the months. And uh, this is true for the whole winter winter period. And so when we look at this trend, uh, the snow water equivalent, which is decreasing here, we may want to conclude that the avalanche activity is decreasing. And so that's that's what they, 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 they were looking at also. And they did a principal component uh, analysis as well. And here, uh, the, the first component is uh, winter precipitation. The second component is winter temperature. So the same, uh, more or less the same component as in the previous study. The third one is related to uh, interannual variability in winter precipitation. So it's also similar to the last one, but here they added something quite important and, and which is interesting at, at our uh, elevations as well is the late spring uh, precipitation. And uh, uh, in, in our case, uh, for example, if we would just take into account the mean trend in precipitation in temperature, we would not uh, uh, reproduce those particular years as, as, as this one, uh, with this uh, very late spring and, uh, and uh, quite a disastrous uh, uh, spring in terms of um, avalanche uh, fatality. And so they also developed the GLARMA, so the, the same uh, type of model, a generalized autoregressive moving average model. And this is what they observed. So here they model the probability of the avalanche as a function of the year. And here they see a decreasing trend. Um, the markers here, uh, represents uh, avalanche years here and non-avalanche years at the bottom. And basically they, they, they correlate this decreasing trends in the probability of avalanche mostly to the decrease in uh, height of snow. But here there is something which is uh, uh, quite uh, interesting in my opinion. If you look at these two peaks here, this peak and this peak, they are correctly marked uh, with a high uh, avalanche probability. But now look at this uh, local minimum in snow height. Because their model mostly takes into account the, the uh, winter precipitation and temperature, and here there is a low level of, uh, of, uh, of snow cover. Here they actually simulate this as a non-avalanche year, but you can see that the point is at the top here. This was an avalanche year. 
And this highlights something quite important is the fact that the structure of the snowpack needs also to be accounted for. Even if you have a shallow snowpack, if you have some persistent uh, weak snow layers, uh, you may have uh, avalanches, even if the, if, the, if the snow cover is not as, uh, uh, as high as uh, other years. So this is for me quite, uh, quite important to, to, to improve in the future. Finally, um, uh, one last study in, uh, in Switzerland, it's in Tech, uh, close to Zermatt. And here, um, I want to show you the main uh, result of their study uh, in, um, in this zone here. So they sampled uh, 300 trees. And the elevation is a little bit intermediate here compared to the first and the second study. It's between uh, uh, 1,400 and 3,200 meters of elevation. So for the release zone, above 3,000. And so we are a little bit at intermediate uh, elevations here. And these are the trees that they sampled here. And the result is shown here. So at the top, it's from uh, 1740 to 1870. So let's not look at the very old years, but let us rather look from uh, um, 1870 to, to, to nowadays. We clearly see from this plot, if we, if we just look at, this, at the plot, um, basically the color of the markers represents uh, the size of the event. So purple means large size, and the size of the marker represents the confidence level. But Clearly, when we see that, we have the feeling, okay, after the 50s, there is a large increase in avalanche activity. That's what a lot of media did when they uh, analyzed this, uh, when they um, um, made some press article about this paper. But actually, when you read in detail uh, the paper, this is just an apparent increase, which is due to a very large avalanche, which occurred in 1920, and which completely destroyed the forest. And since then, they uh, recolonized uh, the slopes and the trees become, became mature between the 50s and 60s. So here, they couldn't make any conclusions uh, on, on the trend. And actually other studies shows that at this typical elevation, there is no clear trend in, in the avalanche activity. So I think it, it's also important to, to, to mention the fact that the forest may change a lot and the human uh, activity here, the recolonization of the forest may also change what we observe. And so we need more data in the future to better assess uh, this, uh, this effect of, um, of climate change. Um, I talked a lot about trees and, and these trees, they are not only here to, to, to give us some reconstruction analysis, they are also here to protect us. They protect us because they prevent the release and they protect us because they, they protect villages uh, um, uh, in the Renault zone. And here, we have a map of the projected changes in forest fire uh, in the future uh, until uh, 2100 uh, year. And here you can clearly see that the Swiss Alps will be very much affected. Of course, if you look at the, the, the global risk, of course, Switzerland will still have a lower risk than uh, Spain or Portugal, of course, but the changes will be marked. And so I think some... Uh, uh, some efforts will be needed in the future to, to tackle this uh, future challenging um, aspect. Finally, I don't know how much time I have. I just want to give you a few more observations on, on the effect of uh, climate change on the on snow type and avalanche types. Uh, here you see on the right uh, uh, a powder snow avalanche, dry snow avalanche in Valle de la Sion. So that's the um, SLF test site. Um, perhaps I'm wrong. That's maybe not this picture. <laughs> Sorry. And here you see a wet snow avalanche in, uh, in Saint-François-Longchamp, uh, which is hitting here a, a cherry. And here it's an analysis of our colleagues in, uh, in France. And here they look at the uh, proportion of wet snow avalanches as a function of the, of the year. And clearly they see an increasing trend in the wet snow avalanches, which is also, of course, correlated with a decreasing trend in powder uh, snow avalanches. And this is, this is quite important because um, the snow type will uh, affect a lot the friction of the snow, as we will see. And, and this is uh, an, additional, uh, sorry, an additional graph, another study here in Switzerland, which also shows the, um, a similar trend, an increase in uh, the proportion of wet snow avalanches uh, with uh, this um, uh, increasing temperatures. And now back to what I was uh, mentioning, uh, this is a graph here of the friction coefficient of snow as a function of temperature. And basically we see that the friction coefficient of snow is increasing. And this, has, uh, this will have a, a significant effect on avalanche dynamics, as we will see in the next slide. It also has an effect, the temperature, 
on how the snow flows. Here you can see that uh, a, a transition was reported uh, between uh, snow flows below minus one degrees and snow flows above uh, minus one degrees. Above minus one, you see the formation of granules, uh, strong and, and, and uh, persistent snow granules. And if the water content uh, appears, we get higher, bigger granules or even slush flows. And this will affect uh, avalanche dynamics, as we see in this plot. Here, this is a plot of the runout altitude in this axis, and here, the probability of reaching the valley bottom. And so clearly, we see an increasing trend of the runout uh, elevation, and so a decreasing trend of, uh, the, um, of the probability of reaching the valley bottom. And so uh, this, this has uh, uh, important uh, uh, consequences uh, that uh, we need to, to, to further in, uh, investigate in the future how this should impact uh, as a mapping procedures. Uh, this is still uh, not fully clear. Uh, this is, uh, we have to, to remember to pay attention that this is the mean trend. And uh, still, we may have extreme events that uh, can reach the valley bottom. So. Um, this is, this is an important point. Uh, finally, as a, as a conclusion, um, if we want to look at uh, the effect of um, uh, global warming on avalanche frequency and intensity, the, the answer is that it's not very clear. Uh, from what I've shown, uh, it's, it's uh, a few studies. At high elevation, it seems that the frequency uh, might uh, increase. Uh, at lower elevation, obviously, the frequency will decrease because we will have less and less snow. This, this seems quite obvious, but in the middle, we don't really know. Um, concerning the avalanche elevation, uh, it increases. Uh, it will, uh, the avalanches will stop earlier, so that's why the runout distance decreases. And we will have more wet snow avalanches than dry snow avalanches. But um, we still need uh, to investigate this deeper in the future. And in particular, concerning um, ASAN mapping procedures, I come back to this. Most ASAN mapping procedures, they consider uh, avalanches. Um, uh, you need to take into account the pressure of the avalanche. And the pressure is generally evaluated using uh, hydraulic considerations. So it's a drag coefficient time density time velocity square. But if you do that, for example, to the Saint-François Longchamp avalanche, which was a very slow and wet avalanche, this pressure will be almost zero. Uh, because the velocity was extremely slow, uh, small, but it destroyed the chairlift. So there is a gravitational component in the avalanche pressure, which needs to be taken into account. And uh, this has been done in the, in the framework of the PhD thesis of Michael Kibert, supervised by Betty Sovila uh, in Davos and uh, Christophe Ancel, also here at TPFL, and uh, investigated the, the, the differences uh, uh, between inertial and gravitational avalanches on the avalanche pressure. And this is important in the future to consider for uh, 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 future hazard mapping adaptation. And finally, uh, a general um, question for the future. I mean, we know dry snow properties quite well, but there are, we, we don't know much wet snow mechanics. So I think this is an area of research for the future. Um, what about adaptation uh, uh, for infrastructures, already existing infrastructures? Do we need some... Um, um, Re, uh, reconstruction some uh, um, to make them stronger uh, do we need to change them and also the effect of the forest which is i think extremely important uh, especially in view of uh, changes in, in in forest fire danger and this is something that we are investigating uh, at our lab so we look at the effect of uh, the forest forest densities uh, uh, forest location um, uh, forest arrangement on avalanche dynamics and how it can help to protect us uh, in the future and with that, I think uh, I am done with my presentation, and I will be very happy to answer some, some questions. Thank you very much.